Great. Well, I'm really pleased to introduce uh, Joe Ehrenberger today. He uh, runs a, basically a uh, uh, amphibian and reptile conservation group. Um, he has a company called Adaptation Environmental Services and um, can be called in to help with uh, issues or problems. But he also works with Colorado Parks and Wildlife. And uh, he was telling me about something very exciting. Maybe some of you know about it. It's called the Recovering America's Wildlife Act. It went through the House. It, it's been sitting a bit. And I think it's about to go through the Senate. It has really strong bipartisan support. And it uses oil and gas money. Um, and it will bring in $1.3 billion for wildlife, of which Colorado will get 25 to 30 million. So we may have some questions for Joe at the end of this, but um, he really, uh, and he's working with uh, some folks at uh, Colorado Parks and Wildlife, the stewardship program uh, manager, Jeff Thompson, to help develop some of the plans of how to, some of these funding, some of this funding could get used once it comes through to help reptiles and amphibians. So without further ado, oh, let me also mention that he's the founder of the Colorado Partners in Amphibian and Reptile Conservation. And he's the chair at the Southwest uh, Partners of Amphibian and Reptile Conservation. So um, without further ado, I think we're very lucky to have Joe with us tonight, who's joining us at a late night for him on the East Coast. He flies back to Colorado tomorrow. Joe, I give it to you. Thanks, Karen. Thanks, Sandra. Um, thanks for having me, everyone. Let me um, share my screen here. Um, it's a real pre privilege to be able to visit with you guys tonight. Um, I, am, I am East Coast currently um, spending my mornings, sipping my coffee, watching, you know, very common Northern Cardinals and, and uh, you know, uh, red-bellied uh, woodpeckers and, you know, a few Carolina chickadees and, and such. So it's been nice to see some East Coast birds um, that I haven't seen in a little while um, and stuff that I know a lot of Colo Coloradans drive, drive, you know, out to the Eastern edge of our state to go see. Um, but thank you for being here tonight. Um, I, I really hope to make this talk interesting to you. Um, I, there's, there's a wide range of stuff that that we will cover. Um, and if, if I am missing something uh, that is of particular interest to you, I'm, I'm more than happy to, to kind of uh, to, to try to answer those questions as, as we go through the talk and at the end of the talk, um, for sure. So I may not be able to monitor the chat fully throughout the talk, um, but um, we'll definitely have some time for questions uh, at the end. So um, I'll, I'll do some introductory stuff um, this evening. Um, tell you about me, tell you about um, our company, some of the work that we've done, um, and kind of go from there. And then um, talk about uh, specific projects we've done in Boulder um, with the county, the city, the state, um, and so forth. And then um, talk about um, a few of the uncommon herp species in Boulder um, that, that we've been able to help find, add a few more dots on the map, um, and kind of chat about. Um, you know, why it's important to, to keep seeing those. And we'll talk about some conservation and action um, stuff to wrap it up. And I'll, I'll uh, talk about the Recovering America's Wildlife Act again, um, a little bit more towards the end as well. Um, so with that, I'm gonna jump right in. Um, you guys saw the introductory stuff that came out on NatureNet and other emails. Um, so I'm the owner at Adaptation Environmental Services, a company that was basically founded um, you know, when, you know, the state has difficulty adding certain positions, but they want to, uh, they, they want to get certain work done. Um, they, they sometimes ask biologists to be contractors. Um, and so that was, that's basically how I got thrown into this. Um, and so I started working closely with the Colorado State Land Board, uh, and they, they asked me to sur survey, you know, some of the, some of their 3 million uh, surface acres around the state of Colorado. Um, for wildlife. And um, so it's not really a bad gig at all. Um, and I, I really enjoyed that, um, was able to uh, collaborate some with, um, you know, Chris Pegg, the former senior ecologist with, with the Nature Conservancy that many of you all know. Um, and 
um, and meet up with several other folks around the state. Uh, I did some of that work did get more focused on looking at lesser prairie chicken habitat on state land board lands, as well as uh, greater sage grouse work um, up in you know Moffat County uh, and a couple other areas up north. So um, you know that that was basically what started it. Um, as I got to do more, we we started doing more herp stuff because you know there's just very few partners that are doing anything with amphibians and reptiles in the state of Colorado and Colorado Parks and Wildlife, their capacity is somewhat limited. Um, there, there is some tremendous work going on with boreal toads, um, and then there's some other work that's being contracted through University of Northern Colorado with um, the Desert Massasauga, uh, but you know, so many of our priority species are, are really just, you know, there's, there's just not anything uh, to get out there and support them. Um, so I've been working with uh, Colorado State Parks and the Colorado, uh, the Resource Stewardship Program um, there. I, I worked directly for that program uh, a little bit and with the Natural Areas Program um, for a while, uh, you know, 10, 11 years ago now. Um, and, uh, and then now I just, I continue on as a volunteer and as a contractor um, in different capacities with CPW. So, um, from that uh, came a niche to work more uh, with rattlesnakes. Um, you know, we've, we've been doing research with rattlesnakes, um, but it, it's something that addressing uh, more direct needs from homeowners um, as, as, you know, they, their homes collide with rattlesnake habitat along the front range. Um, we've, we've tried to find ways to kind of help them out and, and um, you know, and, and just try to deal with that wildlife conflict as best we can. Um, so it's it's been it's been an honor kind of working with with you know so many of our you know colleagues that that are here on the front range that are amphibian and reptile experts and to be able to kind of make some differences in conservation and management here so close to home. Um, so I like I mentioned I, I work with agencies, uh, but before that I actually. Um, Got my master's degree at Indiana State University and Terre Haute, Indiana. And then um, I grew up on the East Coast. Um, but while I was in the Midwest, I worked for Indianapolis Zoo. And um, they were the ones that, you know, I went there to go, you know, learn more about lizards, do some stuff with lizards. But they're like, oh, well, part of the job is working with snakes. So um, I don't have a problem with snakes. And it, it provided a really great opportunity to get a special skill set. Um, that, quite frankly, a lot of people think I'm crazy for having. So, um, but I, I really try to teach responsibility um, and kind of show, you know, the true nature of snakes, um, but also be very realistic about it. I, I get it. People are fearful, fearful of snakes with good reason. Um, you know, there, there's, there's definitely public safety concerns. Um, but let's face it, a lot of these things are, are food for other creatures as well. And they're an important resource that particularly our birds, as well as other wildlife, really depend on. So we need to make sure that those, those populations are, are remaining healthy. Um, so with that, my uh, company is, is Adaptation, and it really becomes a sort of a conglomerate of friends um, that have different, um, different levels of expertise. Um, some of them are um, herpetological enthusiasts, hobbyists, um, others, um, like there, kind of just off to the left. Some of you may recognize Brian Shipley um, from a few years ago. He was a former um, senior zookeeper at Denver Zoo. Um, but we work with different biologists around the country um, and, and work with different folks in different capacities, kind of depending on, on what we need. Um, we, we do stuff with other wildlife. Um, you know, a lot of our work is exclusively with herps, but um, a lot of times we we're very fortunate to you know go down to New Mexico and you know um, help out different land managers with burrowing burrowing owl surveys as well as other raptor surveys um, doing you know cactus surveys things like that. Um, one of our niche uh, you know specialties is that we um, we teach venomous snake safety and manipulation to professionals and organizations. We're not really in the business 
of training anyone and everyone to go out and do this special skill, but we want the people who are helping to manage these areas understand what's going on with these um, with these potentially dangerous animals, but understand you know what really drives their behavior, and then provide those the necessary skills to help people make um, strong management decisions and uh, and enable them to deal with their own uh, potential issues on their properties um, accordingly. Um, we see this as a very positive way to influence conservation of snakes by saying, you know what, we're not just going to come out and tell you not to kill it. Um, that that sometimes doesn't doesn't really help us with our overall mission just to say that, um, even if we feel that way. Um, we just want to give people the right sets of tools and let them kind of make the decision that they think is best for themselves. And we hope that we can um, deter a lot of uh, unnecessary snake killings in, in the process. So um, happy to talk more about that. Um, if you guys have questions, um, it's, it's always a, a very uh, delicate situation um, to deal with, you know, venomous snake safety as a whole. Um, so yeah, our team uh, does consist a lot of volunteers. We provide opportunities for folks um, that, you know, it just, you know, we, we get these, we get invited to do these really great projects. And we wanna share these projects um, with some responsible people that, that you know, kind of help make, make everything better. And so sometimes that, that is um, kids, their parents are around, um, you know, oftentimes on these projects, um, usually after, um, you know, some of the folks have been around for a little bit, um, you know, their parents don't need to be on site with us as much anymore. Um, we get to know them pretty well and we, you know, we know that they're going to follow our rules. Um, but there's also, you know, other folks that, you know, maybe they have other jobs, but they just want to come and help out and see what, see what all this is about. Um, this, this does a really huge thing because um, amphibian and reptile observations are pretty hard to come by. Um, you spend, you know, we know in Boulder County, it can take, you know, um, you, you will find a, a herp, uh, you know, per 0.12 to 0.17 man hours searching for this animal. So the more people you have out there means that, you know, you're just more likely to see an animal when you go out and do a survey. Um, and so we recorded that information in 2014 and in 2015 um, to get that survey effort. Um, and so it's, it's absolutely key for us to have volunteers that are willing to help. And in turn, we give them some really great experience, provide them with letters of recommendation down the road. Um, you can see that little guy there in the front in the bright orange shirt. Um, he's my good friend, Ryan Urbanic, and um, you know, he's getting ready to go to college and, and writing him a letter of recommendation as he prepares for that. Um, and then we also have another a good friend and colleague of mine now who started as a young kid on this project in 2014, um, who's now at CSU. He's, he's one of the chair persons for Colorado Partners in Amphibian and Reptile Conservation. Um, and he's really doing a great job uh, making a name for himself as well. And uh, his name is Hunter Johnson. And so um, right there, uh, raised in Boulder County, um, and uh, he's, he's been really awesome to have on some of these Boulder projects. So, um, so we, we feel very fortunate to have, um, to have been able to work with, with some of our youth to help foster their development, um, you know, with, with herps and conservation and, and, you know, seeing wildlife responsibly. So um, throughout the years, we've, we've done, you know, a nice handful of projects, um, you know, in, in Boulder, you know, still a lot, of, a lot of stuff to go, a lot of, you know, we still have a lot of work to do to catch up to, to a lot of folks who have, who have really, really done some groundbreaking stuff and, and really done some stuff decades earlier. Um, but we're trying to continue this, this current wave of, of getting information out there on the ground, particularly as the front range grows so quickly. Um, and so um, in, in 2015, we did um, a uh, kind of a herp survey at Rabbit Mountain, um, where we went out to just really find what was there and what we thought should be there um, and survey that area. And then at the same time, we wanted to look at 
um, get it, capture a snapshot of rattlesnake activity um, at, at Rabbit Mountain and see how they're using that open space. Obviously, uh, for a lot of us that know this area, we know that there's a lot of rattlesnakes there, um, but really understanding that movement can help um, the, the, the property managers really make good decisions about, you know, trail design or, you know, important areas to potentially avoid or, or work around if you're doing trail construction or, or some other project, um, any kind of burns, we'll talk about that in a little bit, um, anything like that. Um, we also did some uh, amphibian work um, with the city of Boulder uh, uh, Parks and Recreation. Um, and um, I'll talk a little bit more about that as we go through the talk, um, as well as um, with uh, at El Dorado Canyon State Park, um, you know, we, we you know, do some of our work with, with state parks around the state, but at that particular state park, we were able to kind of, you know, get a look at, at what's going on there uh, with, with some herps and kind of um, get an idea and, and kind of direct the park on, on how best to kind of think about that and approach management of that, uh, of, of those species there. Um, uh, we've helped with uh, the herp surveys at Pichel Open Space, um, we, we asked, uh, after Hunter had worked with us for a couple of years, uh, we asked Hunter Johnson to, ju to jump in and lead that effort. And he, he really did a stellar job and we were able to join him on a few outings, particularly early on in that, in, in that project. And he turned that into a high school capstone project um, where he talked about his efforts out there. Um, and then he also helped me out with a, um, after, there was a control burn at Rabbit Mountain. Um, you know, he was able to kind of help, and we were able to revisit some of the some of the data we had before. Um, not totally scientific, but it was it was enough to sort of inform you know that hey, we we need a lot more you know information about fire um, in any habitat in Colorado, but but especially in these really special places on the Front Range. Um, so it was it was pretty key. Um, but yeah, a couple projects there. So our, our co-authors um, on some of these projects uh, with rattlesnakes was um, Tom Matthews, um, and he currently works up at CEML, the Center for Environment, Environmental Management on Military Lands up at CSU, um, works a lot in the South Pacific right now. Um, but he had worked directly with Boulder County, um, and then he and I uh, wanted to do a couple small projects together. So we did, we did some rattlesnake tracking together. And then Andrew Dubois, who is now um, the uh, Jefferson County open space, he's one of the senior wildlife biologists um, working down there. And he's, uh, he's been hugely helpful um, with some of the amphibian work that we've, that we've collaborated on uh, with our partners in, in Boulder. Um, and he still, still works with a lot of those partners in Boulder uh, very directly every year now in his current capacity. And as I mentioned, Hunter Johnson on a, on a couple of those projects um, being, being key. Um, these projects uh, were supported by a ton of volunteers. Um, volunteers really help give a robust effort. It's, it's hard to find um, amphibians and reptiles. Yes, we can go out there and we can find one or two and, and put in a lot of effort to do that, but you just see more and you're able to capture much more with a, with a more robust effort. These animals are very tricky um, to find if you're not you know, used to, to looking for them. Um, and just, it just takes a lot to, to kind of search for them. But um, with that, um, we've done small grant programs from Boulder OSMP, uh, from Boulder County, um, and we've received some uh, uh, funding for equipment from the Boulder County Nature Association, as well as um, when we were doing a Boulder and Jefferson County project, um, the Lois Webster Fund from Denver Audubon was, was really key to kind of help us make sure that we had the right equipment for that as well. So um, it's, it's important that, that, we have, that we have these partners um, that allow small businesses to kind of um, work with, with folks in our area to kind of pull off some, some pretty significant work. So um, we're very, very grateful to, to everybody on this, on this particular screen. It's, um, 
you know, none of this work would be possible without them. So um, we're going to talk about some of the projects a little bit more specifically, but I do want to address, um, you know, I have a section specifically talking about uncommon herps, but I want to talk about some of the ones that, that we do see as well a little more commonly. Um, and we're going to start with here, uh, you know, a, a really commonly encountered snake um, in front range habitats is, is the racer or eastern yellow belly racer, um, if we get down to the subspecies. Um, these guys uh, sometimes get confused with smooth green snakes because they can be um, kind of an olive green, um, but they, uh, when you, once you see a smooth green snake, you, you know for sure that, that you definitely, you know, do not confuse those with racers, but, you know, all the same, these snakes, you know, generally top out, top off around, you know, three feet, three and a half feet here um, out west and they can be olive green, gray, or brown. Um, and then uh, sometimes when there are neonates, um, like this little guy on the right, um, you can start seeing that yellow coming in, but that yellow of that yellow belly really starts coming in as an adult. And so usually during their second year, um, these animals will kind of start making the shift from the heavily patterned animal to absolutely no pattern as an adult. Um, and then uh, you can see, you know, a really long tail um, kind of starting from, you know, um, you know, the, the last, you know, a uh, few inches of the body on, a, on a, a neonate, but then on an adult, it can be, you know, really even the last foot or so, um, maybe even longer, um, a lot of times is, is the tail. So they have a really long tail that tapers down to a fine point. Um, you'll notice you know, the, the round pupils um, on this particular individual. Um, these, these are all really important characteristics. These guys are oftentimes the snakes that, you know, were out there walking around and you're like, I just saw a snake. And then we don't see it anymore. We just don't see it again. And that's because these guys, they, they're, their best defense is just to bolt. And they, they take off. Um, and they, they, if, if you don't kind of keep a good eye on them really um, right away, it's very, very easy to lose them um, into, uh, into the grasses as they blend in really, really well. Um, these snakes eat other snakes, um, including rattlesnakes. They, they don't hesitate to take down snakes or lizards. Um, that, that, that is a favorite food. They, they will occasionally take rodents, um, but these guys are, are really snake and lizard eaters. Uh, by and large, um, and so it's it's absolutely critical that um, that you know you let them do their work. Um, they they're they're definitely a friend of of a lot of people who have a fear of snakes, and particularly a fear of rattlesnakes. Um, you know, just a, a rattlesnake is no match um, for you know at least one that's small enough to be eaten, which can be about the same size as as a you know whatever size the snake is. A rattlesnake of comparable size, um, you know, maybe not much smaller, um, could could be eaten uh, pretty easily by this animal. It's it's pretty amazing to watch something like that happen, um, but it's uh, it definitely does. But yeah, these snakes do not hesitate um, to eat anything that's in their path. So with that, um, you know, I'm going to jump into kind of some of our more specific projects. Um, and then before we get to the next section, I'll introduce you to another common species. Um, but here, you know, for example, at Rabbit Mountain, it was really critical to record these observations of the snakes that occur up there. Um, and so you can see this assemblage here of the species there. Um, we also know what we didn't observe. We did not observe northern leopard frogs at Rabbit Mountain or American bullfrogs. Um, and, um, and during our survey, we did not observe plain spadefoot. Um, and so the plain spadefoot toads were actually picked up the following year um, when Hunter was out doing some road surveys and was able to pick one up on the road. So um, really key that he picked that one, picked that one up there. We don't see any six line race runners out, out at um, Rabbit Mountain or shorthorn lizards or mini line skinks. Really the six line race runners and the shorthorn lizards are species that we would expect to see there. Um, 
However, we noted on some of the eastern parts of, of Rabbit Mountain, which really look like some of the better habitat, uh, particularly for shorthorn lizards, there is a lot of field bindweed. Um, and that bindweed could certainly be restrictive of their movement and something that um, is problematic. We also know that for six sided race runners and shorthorn lizards, we really are approaching kind of the edge of their range with the foothills being right there. Now, certainly, shorthorn lizards are found at higher elevations. They go all the way up into Canada. Um, they're found in mountains in Colorado and in Arizona. I mean, even at Fisher's Peak and, and the New State Park down in Trinidad, we see shorthorn lizards around 8,000 feet pretty regularly. But for Boulder, with the way the, the uplifts work um, with some of those rock formations, it's a little bit different. It's a little bit trickier. And plus with the, the you know, the encroachment um, from people, you know, shorthorn lizards are, are a species of lizard that has really blinked out um, over the years. And we just don't see nearly as many um, as, as what we, we really expect to, expect to have seen. And so um, some of that, th th well, really, there's a lot of reasons why that is probably happening, um, but it's, it's a tough one to kind of not see. Um, we do believe that shorthorn lizards are still in the county um, and on uh, one or two uh, public properties, at least. Um, for example, we know they're at um, the, uh, the National Wildlife Refuge there, um, right at the, the southern part of the county line. Um, but we also know that they're um, you know, on some county land um, as well. Six-lined race runners, we see them all you know, throughout the eastern Colorado, um, north and south. But really, this is the edge of their range um, right there in Boulder County. And right, once you get to the mountains, we just don't, we just don't see them anymore um, at all. And many line skinks, they're, they're just simply, they're hard to find. You, you generally have to have cover um, um, or use kind of pitfall traps. We did not do any kind of invasive trapping um, on Rabbit Mountain, uh, but uh, we also did not find them uh, when we were, uh, you know, looking under a particular cover that we might expect for them. Um, so, you know, many line skinks, not necessarily a surprise not to have found them, but we do want to note that we just, we did not see them that time. Um, and then down at, you know, when we see the snakes that we found uh, also uh, at this site and um, Western hognose was picked up. Um, you know, there was one scene crossing the road. It had been hit by a car, uh, but it, 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 you know, it was, it was maybe just barely hit. Um, and that animal we know was, was pulled to kind of recover. Um, and I, I think it's being used as an education animal now, um, but we haven't seen a Western hog nose since. Um, and so um, we're really at the edge of their range as well for this species um, in this particular area of Colorado. Um, so Western hog nose is another important find, even though they're more common out in the sand hills, more common in certain parts of Colorado, um, these were you know, species that were at the edge of their range. And, and now that edge is, is shifting more east um, as, as we see different habitat manipulations. So it's important to get these um, observations and important to keep track of, of when we last saw species, um, things like that. Um, so, you know, uh, also important for people to understand that, hey, these species could be here. And if you see this, you know, um, you know, this is a big deal. And so you need to, you know, maybe potentially report it to somebody um, so that they can kind of help, help make that happen. So um, with that, um, uh, you know, we also did a rattlesnake portion of, of a project out at, out at Rabbit Mountain. We wanted to look at the movements. And one of the big key things that I, I want to sort of relay about this particular project is that even though we see polygons um, kind of in certain parts of the property, um, I wanna be very clear um, that my experience with rattlesnakes on this property is gonna be very similar to many of your experiences with rattlesnakes on this property. And that is, they are everywhere. And so they use all of the habitats. Prairie rattlesnakes are a generalist species. They will be found everywhere. And they, even if they're moving from point A to point B, they will move through whatever. They'll move through burn areas. They'll move through uh, the Ponderosa pine forest. They'll move through 
um, all different kinds of areas to get to their hunting grounds or whatever. So um, don't be fooled by the polygons is, is basically my point. Um, we see the really light mint green on here is prairie dog towns. Um, and not surprisingly, we see a lot of, of rattlesnake activity um, around those prairie dog towns. Um, you know, one of the really cool things that I was able to participate in um, is uh, I actually got a call from Boulder County this past year. Um, they were looking at um, doing a prescribed burn um, up on Rabbit Mountain to try to enhance some habitat um, that was getting quite a few noxious weeds. And, um, and you know, we, we called and we talked about the work from 2015 and um, as well as the controlled burn work from 2018. And we talked through it and said, well, here's, here's what we're thinking about burning. And, and, you know, what do you think about the herp habitat there? Um, and, you know, we talked about some of the more um, closely watched species by the state of Colorado um, and maybe more sensitive species in this part of the, the area. Um, and we were able to, we were able to get out there and, and um, actually look at some of these areas and, and, Boulder was Boulder County was very interested in you know making sure that we were careful even with rattlesnake rookeries um, and not burning any areas where if it was the time of year that rattlesnakes were still um, you know basically uh, incubating their young. Now rattlesnakes have live young, so a female sitting under a rock uh, baking in, in July and August, they wanted to be very clear about. Well, we don't want a fire to go through that area if that rattlesnake is actively using that area. Um, and, and we absolutely agree with that. And so we put together a small team, went out there and, and looked. Um, and uh, we did find a rattlesnake, but we did not find a rattlesnake rookery um, on that particular day um, that, that all of us volunteers went out there. Um, but we certainly appreciated that, that Boulder County was taking the time to ask that question, revisit this stuff, um, and go from there. And as it turns out on that particular day, uh, we were fortunate to make a few observations of six lined race runners out at Rabbit Mountain um, in a couple of those areas, which we believe that actually, you know, a, a you know, prescribed burn may actually assist that species um, in that area um, and, and enhance habitat for them um, over time. Um, by by just making it easier for these lizards to scoot between, you know, not have to worry about weeds restricting their movements and, and getting in there for more, uh, a, a better native matrix um, of, of native grasses rather. So, yeah. So anyway, it, it's pretty fun to, to know that, that people are looking at your work and that people are thinking about it um, and that it, you know, it, it matters. Um, and so that's something that, um, you know, we're, we're super appreciative of, of our relationships in Boulder, and, and this was really a, one particular case that, that really um, was really special to, to a lot of us that worked on this project. Um, that in mind, I, I, I really want to bring up this point. Like, for a lot of you, um, and I know for, for even myself, when I'm out looking for a rare cactus or I'm out, you know, looking for birds, um, sometimes we're not always thinking about snakes. And so, you know, it's, it's, it's absolutely important that we understand rattlesnake safety um, because we want to make sure that while we're being good stewards of the land, we're, we're fairly representing all the wildlife that's out there um, and not just placing the label, you know, about this, oh, this quote unquote mean rattlesnake, it chased me, it stared me down. You know, it, those things just, it, it just doesn't happen. Um, but we need to understand these animals and some of that starts with proper identification and being prepared to encounter the wildlife that, that we visit, you know, when we're going out into these natural spaces and visiting wildlife home, you know? Um, so, you know, it's, it's absolutely important. So one of the things that we like to talk about is, um, you know, prey rattlesnake is dangerously venomous. So there are venomous snakes in Colorado on the front range that are not dangerously venomous. Um, and so, for example, the hognose snake is not, a, is not considered a dangerously venomous species, as well as the plains black-headed snake is also not considered a dangerously venomous species. Um, and so we, we like to really be very clear with our language about dangerously venomous or a dangerous snake versus a harmless snake. In Colorado, 
um, you know, prairie rattlesnakes, and, and particularly in Boulder County, um, you know, they have they generally have that rattle, or if the rattle is broken off, they have a blunt tail with a black band at the base of the rattle. Um, the base of the head is always wider than the neck, um, always. And then in most cases, in nearly all cases, there are two white facial stripes um, that go down the, the, that's the snake's face. Now, I have to clarify the most because we did have a, a melanistic snake that was a melanistic rattlesnake that had no pattern um, that had been born um, a couple of years ago and had washed into one of the um, canal uh, catchments and, and lions um, that would have come, a snake that would have come off of Rabbit Mountain. Um, and so um, that animal was just a, it was a solid brown rattlesnake. So we know that there's been a couple other, we knew that there was another rattlesnake that was silver um, and patternless as well in Boulder County this year. And we know that there's been other animals. So, you know, be aware that there are these other things. Um, but, you know, even if you're not looking at one particular characteristic, um, you know, if one particular characteristic doesn't seem to line up, we always want you looking at two to three to kind of make that proper ID um, so that you can be safe, at least until you get to a point where you get more practice seeing these animals on a regular basis and, and feel comfortable identifying them. Um, for our harmless snakes, there's no rattle present, but don't, don't be fooled. Even though they have this tail that tapers down to a fine point, um, they, the tail, all of these harmless snakes, they wiggle their tail, every single one of them. Um, it makes it really confusing. So we see these snakes wiggle their tail. More commonly, what we see, again, not 100%, but these harmless snakes will wiggle their tail against the ground, whereas rattlesnakes will almost always hold the tail up to rattle. And so that's a really big key. Um, and so you got to pay attention to um, where the sound is coming from and how it's being projected because um, a, a tail hitting hollow grasses on the ground or, or leaves can definitely make a sound. And even that tail just whipping back and forth, the buzz can be there even though it's, it's much softer than a usual rattle. As well as a rattlesnake, if, if a rattlesnake's rattle is wet, um, the, the sound can be almost impossible to hear sometimes. So you have to really take the time to, you know, give it space and, and make the proper ID as you go back. Now, we do have here on, on this particular slide talking about vertical pupils. Um, and, you know, some of you will probably be shaking your head at this, but, you know, certainly during the day, if you stand back at, a right, at the right area, you can take a picture of a snake, you can zoom in on your cell phone, and you can see that the pupil is vertical. All right. Now, if you're out on a night hike in Boulder County, this may not work because if you shine a light into that pupil, that pupil will blow up and look round, you know, like if at night, because you don't have the bright sunlight, but enough light at night, um, just to even see the pupil at all to try to take a picture, it might appear to be round. Um, and so this is not a, a reliable characteristic that you should solely make an identification off of. You really have to keep in mind the conditions of how you're viewing that animal. Um, certainly on the right, as we look at this bull snake, you can see more of a yellow color versus kind of the greenish or brownish or olive color of that rattlesnake. Um, you know, anybody who sees a pattern thinks that they're seeing a diamond. Um, there's no diamonds on either of these snakes, um, but one is more squared off, um, you know, versus the random polygons that we see on, on the rattlesnake. So, um, we try to look at these different characteristics. These bull snakes have these black marks um, that are along the mouth, and these black marks are pretty consistent with bull snakes, and rattlesnakes just don't have those. Um, so that's another thing. But bull snakes, again, they can project a really loud hiss. They have a flap of skin in their throat that make that hiss um, kind of buzz a little bit, and it, it's very convincing if you're not, if you're not used to hearing it. Um, bull snakes are very, very good at mimicking um, rattlesnakes and, and seeming, you know, larger than life uh, in, that, in that way. So they can be very intimidating. <laughs> so if you want to reduce your risk of, of rattlesnake, we'll kind of go, you know, a little bit opposite here. We want to keep, you know, keep your dog leashed, wear close, uh, closed-toed shoes, 
stay on designated trails, be aware of your surroundings, um, keep earbuds out, um, you know, particularly for those that love to exercise in our open spaces, um, and look closely before you sit, step, or grab. Um, and then, you know, never attempt to move or harm a rattlesnake. Um, you know, killing a rattlesnake can make it actually more dangerous, um, especially if you kill it and then you look to move it off the trail. Um, that snake um, sometimes can still bite, um, even dead. And so we, we have to be very, very careful of that. It's just a, a reflex um, mechanism that reptiles have. Um, so you, you have to be very, very cautious about that. So we, we recommend just leave it alone in the first place. Besides, most of these open spaces have, have policies where you're not supposed to harass wildlife at all anyway. Um, so always give it space and time. These snakes can move fast, but sometimes these snakes, they just need time to figure out that you're even there. Um, and then they need to, you know, show themselves as being defensive before they kind of move off on their own and realize everything is okay. So <clears throat> it is important to have a bite plan whenever you go out um, to our open spaces as well. Um, if you were bitten by a rattlesnake, the, the one thing that we really want you to do is call 911. Um, we say remain calm. It's really hard to remain calm but try to remain calm. We want to really not change the situation. Um, we don't want your heart rate to go up. We don't want your heart rate to go down. We just want, we want the EMTs to show up there and be, be helpful and get you to the right place, take you to the correct hospital. Not every medical facility has anti-venom on the front range um, or anywhere in the US. And so it's, it's really important that you get to the right place. Um, now, the CDC had said for a while that we want to, um, you know, keep the area at or below the level of the heart, um, and this recommendation is changing. Um, this is something that um, we we basically say, you know, now that that we we want to go ahead and keep it above the heart level, the same as we would do with regular first aid. Um, and so uh, you want to be very very mindful of this. We know that if that venom is 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 kept below the level of the heart that it'll cause pooling and cause more damage um, in, in the extremity uh, if, if we don't allow it to move around. We want the whole body to fight this. Um, and so, you know, we don't want anything constricting it, rings, bracelets, uh, any, you know, definitely no tourniquets, anything like that. And then um, we recommend that you circle the bite, record the time that the bite occurred. That way there's no, no confusion of oh, I walked through this area and I got poked by a bunch of plants or, you know, I was around some cactus and, you know, I'm bleeding from here. Like we want to know very, we want the doctors to know exactly where the bite area is um, and whether or not you're showing any symptoms. Um, so be very mindful of that. And similarly, if for those of you that go out there with, with dogs, um, we want you to be very, you know, be very careful as well and have a plan. Know that your facility has, um, has antivenom again, not every veterinary hospital has antivenom, and you need to pick up your uh, pet if possible um, to uh, restrict the movement and just, um, you know, again, not getting the heart rate up or down, you know, and call ahead and make sure that they're ready for you and that they're, they're ready to deal with you. So with that, um, we're going to jump back right, right back in. Please keep this in mind and please be safe when you're going out into the field. Um, looking for whatever else. Please be mindful of, of prairie rattlesnakes. <clears throat> so a really important species in the city of Boulder in the state of Colorado is um, the northern leopard frog. And so um, we did some surveys in 2017 and 2018. And in 2017, we were surveying 10 parks and rec properties um, some that had historically had the species um, and some that, that might seem like good habitat. And so um, as it turns out, we did not find any um, at, at that time. And so um, northern leopard frogs, it's not surprising. They can be a, a difficult to detect species. They move around a lot. They don't just stay at ponds um, all day long. Um, and they can be kind of, they can have a quieter call. Um, but usually we say if you surveyed an area, you know, four or five years in a row, it probably doesn't have them. 
but that doesn't mean that they won't come back in and use it in the future or anything like that. It just means they're not they're not currently there. So there's a considerable amount of effort um, that has to go into um, documenting these species. Um, and so we worked with Parks and Rec on that project, but worked very closely with OSMP um, and uh, Boulder County um, to kind of um, keep them in the loop with with you know any any properties that were adjacent to the properties that they manage, uh, but just really work with partners um, on that. And then in 2018, we were doing some some work um, to again trying to look for uh, different frogs um, and you know potentially control bullfrogs. And we did find a tadpole uh, at uh, a northern leopard frog tadpole at one of the uh, Boulder County uh, sites. And so it was important to get that. Now, we haven't picked up on, on any more northern leopard frogs since then at Boulder County sites. So it's not that they're not managing the properties right. I think they are. Um, but um, it's just these are hard to detect species, and some sites are easier to find than others. Um, and again, at the state park, um, we were able to use a song meter, an acoustic monitoring device. Um, to, you know, a lot of times we see them used on bats um, these days, but we will use them on, on uh, amphibians as well. And um, we were able to pick up a calling frog um, using one of the habitats at El Dorado Canyon. Um, and so it, it gives us a lot of questions about how are they using that area? What are they connecting to? And, and um, you know, kind of what happens, what happens from there. So, um, as a result of all this, we, you know, there's been a lot of discussion and, and talks with partners. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's not all doom and gloom. Like, yes, these frogs are there. No, they're not everywhere. Um, you know, we had, we had some, you know, absence data for sure. And that was tough. But I, I will say this, Boulder as OSMP arguably has the, the best handle on this species in the state and likely the entire West. Um, I, I cannot, you know, emphasize this enough. Uh, Boulder, Boulder OSMP, Open Space Mountain Parks, they have an incredible uh, staff and they put forth some incredible efforts that really, really, really do some novel things. They, they, They've been inventorying uh, their species for you know years. They know exactly where everything is. That they're strictly in the monitoring phase now, where they just keep track of how these populations are going year to year, and that's kind of the place where most agencies want to be. But a lot of us just don't have the capacity or the funding um, or the manpower to really pull off. Um, but Boulder OSMP has been has been able to do this, and it's been huge. And just that. Um, has has really influenced how you know the city of Longmont is able to control um, you know bullfrogs or approach their projects, look at northern leopard frogs, um, you know, inform them on where to look at their uh, you know on where to focus efforts, and the same with the Boulder, Boulder County. So there is this trickle down effect from what Boulder, Boulder OSMP is doing that is really doing some great things for that area and really Boulder as a whole, all of the agencies in that um, are really leading our state right now um, with, with some solid work and asking some solid questions. Um, so I, I can't emphasize that enough. Like this is, this is a really exciting place to be in with that. Um, and additionally with that, you know, the city of Longmont asked me a question several years ago uh, about bullfrog control. And that led to some really key questions in the state um, that, that you know, sort of influence how the state is now approaching bullfrog control. And so there's some exciting research that's being done, um, not only to use uh, environmental DNA um, samples to find northern leopard frogs, but also looking at bullfrogs um, so that we can kind of figure out who's in what water, even if we don't see them there. And so, and then how do we control them? And so there's some really important conversations being done at the state and at the Western level, um, like all Western states um, that really are heavily influenced by what happens in your home county. Um, and so we were, you know, it's, it's absolutely exciting times um, to kind of be a part of this, this really 
monumental work. Now, now bullfrogs, they are a U.S. species. Um, they, they're found in the southeastern U.S. They do make it naturally um, into Texas and into Kansas um, and Oklahoma. But, you know, um, the majority of folks that have really looked at this say these, these frogs really should not have made it much past central Kansas, um, you know, or central Texas. Uh, and um, and they're, they're really not a native species in Colorado. And I sort of, you know, I bring it up that way because um, there, there is some information that suggests maybe bullfrogs are a Colorado native species, um, uh, just barely in the southeast portion of the state. However, when you start really asking the people who have, have really done the in-depth research, you know, they, they don't, they have a harder time buying that argument. And they, they really believe that, that bullfrogs are a non-native species. That being said, everybody, um, you know, does not, you know, everybody that you talk to believes that um, bullfrogs should not be in Boulder County. They should not be on the front range. They should not be anywhere further west at all, um, you know, but yet they're in every state out west and they're, they're problematic. They were introduced in, um, by the agency um, a long time ago as another form of, of recreation, um, hunting and and things like that, but that was before we knew how problematic they were. Um, and so, you know, we hear this with a lot of species. Bullfrog, it's, it's the same thing. Um, but but bullfrogs, the, the problems with bullfrogs is that as you start diving into the literature, you realize that they can eat anything. They eat rattlesnakes, you know, young ones. They eat birds, they eat ducks, they eat songbirds, uh, particularly ground nesting songbirds, um, that anything that likes to be near the water, um, you know, we can see videos um, on social media and on YouTube every now and then, um, but, but bullfrogs are voracious predators. They've, they've, um, we even have a documented one that, that ate a Preble's Meadow jumping mouse um, in Colorado, uh, which is an endangered species, a federally endangered species. Um, and so um, bullfrogs are not supposed to be here. They're bigger than all the other native frogs and they eat all the other native frogs. And so, um, you know, they eat whatever fits in their mouth. So this is something where, um, you know, investigating the efforts further, trying to figure out cost-effective ways to make sure that our birds are eating, you know, healthy food and not junk food like bullfrogs. We wanna make sure that they're eating the right thing um, and that we have plenty of the right thing for them to eat. Um, you know, and that at the same time, that the that northern leopard frogs, chorus frogs, um, and and the other amphibians also have a chance to kind of do their thing uh, without a problem from from bullfrogs. So it's something that um, it's very very difficult to control, but there are opportunities for control and management um, in the county. Um, but you know, there's going to be some places where where they will they will persist, and so this is. This is kind of a big, it's a big battle, um, but it, I believe it's a battle that, that um, the managers who are taking it on are absolutely doing the right thing um, because it affects a lot more wildlife um, than, than most people think. Um, so this is a big deal. We, we do not need bullfrogs. And again, OSMP does a lot with bullfrog control. Um, not all methods that they use can be applied to everywhere. Um, but they're, they're doing a really great job with, with inspiring some methods about, you know, how to get in there and, um, and really manipulate a system so that they can, you know, control bullfrogs a lot better. Um, so that, that's a pretty exciting thing to be, to be in an area where, you know, places like Arizona, Nevada, you know, Idaho, they're doing some pretty cool things too, but they also want to know what's happening in, in Boulder. Um, and so, um, I, I'm really pri privileged to have been part of some of these conversations and, and projects, and we have a coalition here on the Front Range um, that meets quarterly every year just to discuss what everybody's doing to keep everybody on the same page, um, and that's going to help us, you know, make a better effort about, you know, how to, you know, when you're, when you're spending money to do this thing, how to spend that money more effectively uh, and, and efficiently, and so, um, there's some really, really cool things going on. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I, I can't speak highly enough about it. So 
um, talk about some uncommon species, um, but uh, this is not one. This is the Woodhouse's toad. Um, you guys, any of you who go to places, you know, at sundown, likely see these things fill up some of the parking lots um, that you're visiting. Um, and these things are everywhere. That that light stripe that goes down the back, um, you know, from its head all the way down to its butt is a is a is a pretty obvious characteristic. The other thing you're going to notice about this particular toad is that you know it's fairly dry looking, it's fairly warty and bumpy, um, but there's not there, there's no symmetry in the pattern. Um, whereas if you go out east a little bit and you you know you know Weld County, you might see some Great Plains toads, and there's much more symmetry. Um, in the pattern and more green, um, really a, a more, a, a better green rather than an olive green, um, something that's more evergreen on, on like a Great Plains toad. So these woodhouse toads are, are, are really common. Some of them can be pretty big, close to the size of, you know, some small apples. Um, and uh, they, they eat a lot. Um, and they're, they're really, really great. They're fun. Um, these are one of the species that, that are, they're very common. We want to make sure that they stay common. Um, we do not want to lose these guys. Um, and so um, right now they, they seem to be doing pretty well in our area. So hopefully we can, you know, kind of continue to see that trend as well. But let's dive into some more, uh, so some less common species. So um, during our survey at Rabbit Mountain, um, we knew that line snakes were, were in Boulder County, but they were, we, they had only been documented at the southern end of Boulder County. And through this survey, we documented that we documented them almost up near the Larimer County, Boulder County line. Um, so that county line. Now, I personally believe that they're probably in Larimer County, uh, but nobody's found them there yet. So there's a county record um, waiting to be chased. Um, so, but you can see these guys are kind of similar to garter snakes. They're gray with a light white or, or gray stripe um, that goes down their back. Um, you can see the neck is pretty similar size to the head, um, you know, and these, these guys don't, don't, don't get very big. Um, you can kind of see in that little caption um, or the little side picture that they, um, that belly pattern is pretty unique. These are a harmless species um, and they have these, you know, this, this little uh, track going right down their belly is what it looks like the, of those black marks. Garter snakes don't have that. Garter snakes have a plain belly. Um, and so um, when, we, when we look at these guys, you know, that's, that's one of the easy ways to tell that this is not a garter snake. Um, you know, so, so keep that in mind. These guys just don't have any color either. Um, certainly some of our wandering garter snakes could be a little confused with this, but any of the plains garter snakes um, or red-sided garter snakes would be, be less confused with this species. So, um, we also have on the right, the Plains black-headed snake. <clears throat> now, um, this monster, um, you know, rivals about the size of a number two pencil um, as an adult. And he uh, they eats a lot of centipedes. And so um, he, he has a, he, he is venomous, um, but it's uh, pretty darn near impossible for him to really land a meaningful bite. Um, and, you know, it doesn't seem like the, you know, the, the venom is, is really dangerous to people at all either right now. So um, it's, it's, it's kind of interesting, but um, both of these snakes are, are fossorial. Um, they live underground a lot. And when, when we do find them, sometimes it's after a rain um, and that rain uh, pushes them to the surface and exposes them that way. And so that's, that's one way we might detect them. Um, there's, there's several other ways we might try as well, but um, but that is one way. Um, so these these are kind of cool things. And with the Plains black-headed snake, we had a couple dots from you know the southern part of the county, and and um, but to be able to extend the range here for Plains black-headed snakes up into um, you know the northern part of the county was was pretty cool to pick up that observation as well. These are not species you see regularly typically. Um, so so it's it's good to uh, you know note that. Similarly, the hognose snake, we talked about that one a little bit already. Um, you know, the last record seen in, in Boulder County um, was likely that one in, in 2014. Um, so, and then we do have milk snakes. Now, milk snakes, um, <clears throat> we talk about species of greatest conservation need. And um, 
you know, and, and that's what fall, that's how they are referred to in the State Wildlife Action Plan, um, for those of you that are familiar with that document. And um, the milk snake is one that we just don't have enough information on. Now, we don't necessarily think they're quite as uncommon as they used to be, um, or, or, you know, we just think that they're seldomly seen. Um, you got to be out there at the right time to find them if they're up um, above ground at all. Um, a lot of times these guys will be cruising in the rocks or, or underneath the rocks, so they can be very, very difficult to detect. Um, we do not have coral snakes in Colorado. And so um, the Central Plains milk snake, the subspecies of this one, um, is, is really, it's a coral snake mimic, but we don't have any coral snakes here. But these milk snakes have such a very, very broad range going from Canada down through Mexico and Central America. Um, and so, you know, we just, we, we get to have the fun species and not the dangerous one. Um, unfortunately, both of these species um, can get hammered by the pet trade. Um, they, they are, they are uh, sought after species, um, you know, uh, for pet trade. And so uh, we, we are very sensitive about sharing locations um, for these species because, um, you know, we do worry about people going in and, and, and illegally collecting them. Um, so particularly if it's on an open space, it doesn't, you know, Western hognose snake, you, you can collect in Colorado, but um, you, you can't do it on an open space where there's no, no wildlife collection um, anyway. So we, we have to keep that in mind. Uh, we have a red-sided garter snake, which basically follows the South Platte drainage. Sometimes individuals can be a little more vibrant than others. Um, it's, it's a little tough lighting with the one on the right. You can kind of see some red, red flecks, uh, but that animal is not nearly as pretty as the one on the left um, as a whole anyway. But these, these snakes, they get pretty big. Um, and they can be, you know, the, the females can be, you know, up around three feet, maybe some of them over um, from time to time. We did find one exceptionally big one um, up at Rabbit Mountain. Um, and, you know, the, it was certainly in, in a system close to the Little Thompson. Um, but, you know, these, these snakes are, are an SGCN. They're species of greatest conservation need. They're highly sensitive to water um, the, and water quality. And so we need to make sure that the water quality is right. And so we know that like they're at St. Brain State Park. Um, we also know there's a lot of bullfrogs at St. Brain State Park. Um, so, you know, bullfrogs, you know, would have no problem taking some of the smaller individuals of the species. So it's one that we, we definitely want to monitor water quality as well as, um, you know, uh, an invasive species taking it out and be very mindful of, of what's going on with that. We just, we don't have enough enough information on this species. Um, I think the last time some, some really strong work had been done has, has probably been 15, 20 years at least. So I brought up the shorthorn lizard already, six-lined race runner. Um, both of these guys, you know, shorthorn lizards might be susceptible to pesticides, susceptible to noxious weeds, um, susceptible, you know, these guys are primarily ant eaters. Um, and so um, they will occasionally take some other, some other, uh, you know, insect prey, um, but they, they really like eating ants as well. Um, and so horned lizards seem to be declining um, throughout their range in the U.S. They're still fairly common with this one being really one of the more common lizards, but these guys used to be all over the place in Boulder County or much more common at least than what, than what they are now. Um, and so Certainly, um, you know, human encroachment, habitat shifts, um, you know, just don't, don't favor this species anymore. And the same is going to be said with the six-line race runner. Maybe not super abundant, um, you know, as you get closer to the foothills, um, but um, just because it, the habitat shifts naturally away from, you know, from what this species really likes. But they are a species that we, we should continue seeing, and certainly Seeing them at Rabbit Mountain is very encouraging this year. We just want to make sure that we, we continue seeing them at, at Rabbit Mountain and continue seeing them at, at certain open spaces um, because these, these are important. You know, it's shrikes need to eat, um, but these guys, they do a job eating a lot of bugs too. So um, it's, it's, it's critical kind of having these guys around. So I mentioned the plain spade foot over here on the right, you know, not quite as dry looking or, or bumpy looking um, as the Woodhouse's toad. 
um, their pattern <coughs> is, um, you know, is, is kind of random, similar to the Woodhouse's toad, but it's, there's no stripe that goes down the back. Um, you can't see it on this particular individual, but it just, it looks different. Um, these guys, they're, they're smaller. Um, they have this little special um, keratinized, um, you know, spade on the bottom of their foot that helps them dig into the ground well, where they will kind of estivate um, until it rains and they'll come out and feed and, and you know, they do stay active. They're not, um, they don't just only come out when it rains, but, but they, you know, they, they are a little more habitat and, and climate needy than, than some of our other species. And they don't, um, it, it, it can be a little harder to find them. They're not quite as common as, as um, some of our other amphibians. Though, if you get to other parts of the state, um, they, they are really, they're, they're going gangbusters in certain areas where they just reproduce in roadside ditches um, pretty easily and, and do really well. Um, but they, they're slightly harder to detect species than, you know, a Great Plains toad or a Woodhouse's toad. And on the left, we have the northern leopard frog. Now, one of the things, one of the reasons why I chose this picture is because you can see one of the frogs is clearly green. One of the frogs is clearly brown. Um, yes, you see spots. And for those of you that, that know, you, bullfrogs can also have spots. Um, but what we look at is you see this gold line on the brown frog on the lower right. And that gold line, we call that a dorsal lateral ridge. So dorsum being the top, the lateral to the side. So this is up on top and off to the side, dorsal lateral ridge. That ridge goes you know, from behind the eye all the way down to its butt and it's unbroken. Um, so for those of you that are familiar with Plains Spadefoot or Plains, not Spadefoot, Plains Leopard Frogs um, down in Southeastern Colorado, um, as you follow that dorsal lateral ridge down towards the back of the legs, um, the, the ridge breaks. And that's one of the identifying characteristics aside from the call also being different um, is, is how that, that ridge um, you know, looks. So that, that's kind of a key thing when you're taking a picture to kind of note those differences. Um, but yes, northern leopard frogs can be brown and they can be green. Um, and so uh, it's, it's important to kind of you know, get used to seeing that. Now, bullfrogs, they don't have that ridge. Um, you know, bullfrogs are smooth um, or, or some really tiny bumps all the way down their back. But the bullfrogs, um, this line, it, it just curls around their tympanum or their ear, um, you know, right behind the eyeball, and that's it. There's no ridge that goes down their body. So when you see a bullfrog that has a bunch of spots on it, <clears throat> you can look at the tympanum, look for a dorsal lateral ridge, and see if it's there. So that's a, kind of a key characteristic to help ID um, that, that particular animal. So I want to kind of wrap up our talk and just talk about a couple conservation actions. Um, but <clears throat> for our last kind of common species we're covering, I, I want to talk about the um, uh, this little prairie lizard. Um, it can be also called a plateau lizard, though um, it can also be called a fence lizard. Um, these are all the same things. The name has changed a bit, um, you know, since the early 2000s, um, based on kind of taxon taxonomic revisions. Um, but the correct name in this area currently is the prairie lizard. And um, we see ones with kind of more stronger striping um, than the one you see on the bottom right. Um, and the pattern can be somewhat variable. We can also see ones with much less pattern, <clears throat> almost solid gray with maybe a couple black flecks. The pattern doesn't matter. When you're looking at this lizard, um, there is local variation. And so you just kind of want to look at the shape and the size. You see a lizard perched up on a rock like that, and you kind of get the, a glimpse of that blue underneath on the sides, on the flanks, and then also at the, on the throat. That's a strong characteristic of, of this being a, um, you know, the, the prairie lizard. These are, these are fall into the group of spiny lizards, which are found throughout the US um, and, and Central, uh, Central America. But spiny lizards all have these scales that kind of stick out a little bit more and look a, look a little more rough um, than say our, our skinks might look or some of our race runners might look. So the scalation is, is, is a little bit different. Um, but these guys, wherever you really have rocks, um, these guys are pretty common in Boulder County. When we get out into the Eastern Plains, um, they look a little bit different. Um, they might use fence posts a little bit more. 
um, or just running undercover. If there is cover like trash or anything like that, these guys might be under there. Um, you know, but they, they run around, um, you know, thermoregulate by, by running between shade and sun. Um, and, and that's usually, you know, the bulk of their activity, run out, go eat a bug, run back to the shade if it's, if it's really warm, um, but certainly be out in the morning. But in the front range, we, we really see them, you know, particularly in the foothills habitats, <clears throat> they're, we, we spot them on rocks and they're, they're really easy to spot on rocks. Um, and so that's, that's kind of a, a common lizard and one of the more common ones that, that we're really seeing out there. And again, it's prairie lizard. Um, but if you call it a fence lizard, you know, everybody's gonna know what you're talking about anyway, because that was their former name for so long. So certainly with threats, um, we talked about wildlife harassment a little bit more. It's, it's really kind of analogous to um, kind of what we see with, with you know, some, some folks who really, really care about birds and really want to monitor some nests, maybe with a little bit too much love. Sometimes you just have to leave these animals alone. And so um, with, with the herps, you know, we do see a lot of people that they know certain spots to go look. They want to handle these animals, get a picture of them, pose them a certain way, but they're not really collecting any, any helpful data on them. Um, that, that really constitutes wildlife harassment. And so um, we really try to discourage that. All of the herps that we handle are handled under permit, um, and we, we handle them for a minimal amount of time. Um, if they have to be handled at all, um, a lot of times we just rely on, on stellar photography to kind of capture the identifying characteristics um, and use that for a voucher record um, and just leave the animal alone. Um, and so, but illegal collecting and poaching, um, they are issues in Colorado. I don't necessarily think they're as big as they are in other places, um, but it does happen. And we know certain places where it's pretty common. Um, you know, pollution is another one um, that has, you know, we talked about uh, water quality and red-sided garter snakes. It's a really big deal. So a lot of times we think of pollution as maybe being, you know, maybe, oh, amphibians because permeable uh, skin, you know, would allow pollutants in. Yes, yes, that's definitely a risk. Um, but we, we definitely see it with reptiles too, um, and, and even with, you know, shorthorn lizards um, and, and, you know, potential pesticide use or, or other things like that, pollution definitely uh, plays a factor. Um, you know, noxious weeds can be a problem and um, they can contribute to, to, you know, to too much fuel for a fire. Um, but with fire, you know, fire is largely a good thing for these species. Um, you know, we just have to be, you know, we just don't always have the opportunity to, to use fire as a tool. So sometimes we'll turn to grazing to kind of get those fuels down so that if a fire was to naturally start, um, it doesn't, it doesn't happen, you know, it doesn't become like what just happened recently um, in the county. And so um, it's, it's tough. Fire, fire is a really, really tough one. But um, you know, being able to keep grasses down is, you know, it allows species like shorthorn lizards and, and race runners. Um, and for many of you, you, you also know many of our grass, uh, our grass, grassland nesting birds rely on different levels of, of grass. You know, there's thinking of a great paper that, that came out years ago from Bird Conservancy of the Rockies that really had a graphic, a really nice graphic for, you know, what birds, you know, like stuff, you know, you know, all the way down from like a, a mountain plover, all the way up to you know something like a dixisle where or a bubbling where where you know birds like you know taller tall grasses. Um, well, herps are the same way. Um, we're really describing the same thing, and so we need to find a way to get this matrix in there. Um, fire is is would be a great tool if it wasn't so dangerous, um, and so sometimes we turn to grazing as a way to kind of help and and that can be helpful. So, um, and then, you, you know, the other threat is, is just not knowing what's there. Um, and with, by us not knowing what's there, we can't really protect it. And so getting an inventory of what's going on is, is absolutely key. And certainly while, while Boulder OSMP seems to have a pretty good handle um, for a lot of things, they don't know everything. Um, but places like, you know, Boulder County, City of Longmont, 
um, Lafayette, Louisville, a lot of these places could use your help with these observations. Track these observations, get these things going, and, and really help us out so that, so that these managers can know what's there and have some extra eyes on the ground to help them. Um, and then, you know, recording these observations, you can do that through iNaturalist or HurtMapper. Um, you know, there's a lot of good things about these software. Uh, they're not perfect, um, but they are absolutely key in, in helping get information to the right managers. Managers have easy access to this information. Other folks do not necessarily. Um, sensitive species are blocked um, in general. Um, but yeah, so, so please, please keep that in mind. And we talked about Recovering America's Wildlife Act at the start. This is a piece of legislation that had gone through the House before. Um, you know, it's going to have to go again because um, it's a different session of Congress, but it's in the Senate now. A significant bipartisan support comes from severance funds, um, you know, and could potentially give Colorado about $26 million annually for species like we're talking about tonight and for species like, um, you know, Boulder Audubon is, is largely interested in more directly. Um, this, this is huge. 25% um, matching funds would likely be required, um, but it's something that CPW is, is working through right now and trying to figure out. Um, so these are these are all all big big things. Learn more about this. You can go on Colorado Parks and Wildlife a page that they have set aside for this, and you can you can view this and how they would spend the money more directly. I strongly encourage you guys to get behind that. It's a it's a it, it would really change the way wildlife is managed um, in the United States. Um, so so definitely pay attention to that. With that, thanks to Kevin for photos for tonight. Um, you know, he's been super helpful on these projects um, and, and certainly his, his photo document, documenting of, of all these species has been absolutely critical. Um, but thank you for your time. I'm happy to entertain some, some questions if we have some time. Thank you. We do have some great questions in the chat. Uh, I'm going to start with one that was, is probably all on our minds. And since you brought it up, uh, the later part of your talk uh, about the role of fire, um, Kathy Heckel asks, how might the Marshall fire have affected herps? Yeah, so it's, it's a great question. So, um, one of the things that we, we do know is that when grasslands become, um, too dense and, um, you know, you, you run the risk of, of pushing certain species out. Um, but one of the things we don't really know is what happens on our grasslands after fire. And so um, I, I think there's a, a lot of really good educated guesses um, that, that's out there, but we don't really do a lot of fire research um, in the United States. And so it's, it's, it is fairly limited now. There are some people that are very eager to look at this and look at, at what happens, um, but there, there's kind of, there's some, you know, I think by and large with herps, we think that it would probably help um, more than it would hurt, um, but it may take some time to see the benefits of that um, because we need sort of that, that native matrix to come back in. Now, certainly the Marshall Fire is a particular you know, it's a tough one because, um, you know, there's a lot of noxious weeds around and are noxious weeds the first things that invade that area? And if noxious weeds come in, well, then, you know, what does that do uh, for birds or herbs? And that, that's going to be kind of a tricky question. And, and sometimes if we're looking at it from the bird standpoint, we might actually get our answers more quickly, um, you know, or get a head start looking at the, how birds respond to that change. Um, then before we would really fully understand it with herps, because herps are so hard to detect, um, it may take a longer time to to understand that information. So, um, so that's what I mean by that. Hard to say. Thanks. We have a couple questions about um, uh, iNaturalist. Um, one from Pam Piambino. Have you seen any surprises in the postings on iNaturalist? And Megan also asked, and I'll piggyback on that, are there specific iNaturalist projects to add observations um, or 
would, would it be better to just add to the location and people will find them? Yeah, so, um, you, you know, iNaturalist, there, there might be specific projects, um, like for example, the State Parks Nature Finder um, is, is one that, that we directly work with um, and, and help out. Um, but a lot of times if you're just there and you're just recording that information, the data that you collect can automatically fall into some of those projects or be collected by, by the projects. If you go to a state park and record that observation, it can be recorded there. Now, it doesn't necessarily get all of the data um, that that project is seeking to have, but that occurrence or that observation um, could be recorded for sure. Um, now, uh, iNaturalists is, um, it, it's, it's a good one. There, you do wanna sometimes, you, know, you wanna go through the extra security measures of <clears throat> trying to protect that data. And iNaturalists is working with state managers on how to better um, protect certain data or provide a really large buffer around it. Um, but that is something that, that you, you wanna do um, is, is because herps, we kind of think of like maybe uh, nesting birds or you know, like a rare plant, the location can be so specific that we don't necessarily wanna make that location vulnerable. Um, so, so keep that in mind as well. Um, but yeah, um, iNaturalist is, is great. Um, did I, I feel like I'm missing part of that question. That uh, the, the part about surprises. Oh yeah, surprises. So in Boulder County, no, not necessarily. Um, however, we picked up, um, let's see, we, we picked up another species of whiptail uh, in Colorado, as well as um, a location of a whiptail that um, you know was is a western slope species, but has found its way over the continental divide. And so, um, whiptails have been interesting ones. Where um, we have a, a species from New Mexico that showed up in Trinidad, um, and it was because it was detected on somebody put it down on iNaturalist, and so that that was chased by a researcher, um, by you know by by Lauren Levo. She she did a lot of that work to kind of document the findings on that species. Um, we don't really know how they got here. We suspect that they, um, for lack of a better term, that they rafted their way over, um, either on the railroad or whatever, but they found a way to kind of ride something. We, we, there's no reason to think that those whiptails were necessarily intentionally planted, even though they could have been. Um, you know, we, we have some questions about the spiny soft shell at, um, you know, over at Boulder Reservoir, you know, whether or not they were actually there or were they were they dropped off there by fishermen or something like that the spiny soft shell turtle you know like we know that they're in the south Platte, so it's you know you kind of go back and forth as to how likely is this um you know so we, we see some things like that every now and then thanks i'm going to combine a couple of questions here one from terry and one from harry price uh terry wonders has, has been observing wildlife on his, his uh, own property for over 30 years and noticed a decline in the toad population last year. Is that a trend? And um, Harry raises the question about no turtles, no salamanders in your, what you shared. Is that also um, a conspicuous absence? Yeah, so, um, so we actually, during the Boulder uh, Parks and Recreation Survey, we we did see some turtles. We got you know snapping turtles. We got western painted turtles. Um, we, we are really at at the edge of the range for turtles, um, though we expect Boulder to certainly have those two species. Um, we also know from Lauren Levo's work that there are red-eared sliders, um, which are non-native species, um, which do occur in in, in Boulder waters. Um, as far as amphibians, we know that you know tiger salamanders are kind of everywhere. Um, and we continue to see them in the places where we expect to see them. Um, again, they're habitat generalists. They're the most widespread amphibian in the state of Colorado. And um, you know, we do see them there. We're not seeing any weird health issues with them, anything like that. Um, we're watching that because of the, the chytrid uh, fungus that affects frogs. There's another one that specifically affects salamanders, but it, it has not shown up in the U United States as of yet. Um, that we are aware of. It's not, it's at least not been detected in the U.S. It's probably a more accurate way of saying it. 
As far as amphibian decline, uh, you know, looking at it from a one year thing, it's, it's hard because um, you, you might not have seen a lot of amphibians last year, but that serves as last year. So it's, it's really a sample size of one when we think about it in scientific terms. Um, what we really wanna know is trend data. And so are you seeing a decline over the course of five years? Um, and you know, are you not seeing the species at all? Uh, are you seeing the species some, um, you know, and there's different things you can do. Like you can just record these, uh, you know, these observations, much like we might record the phenology of, of birds at a bird feeder where we say, okay, well, I, this is, you know, the first time I saw a, a bullet oriole at, at, you know, this site um, in a cottonwood tree um, this year. And, you know, when you make those observations, are we getting a trend that is looking earlier and earlier? Um, it would be the same with amphibians. Are we getting the calls? Are we not seeing as many individuals? Any things like that? And one year is not a one year doesn't really tell us much other than let's see what happens next year. But three to five years is a really good cycle to watch. Um, you know, and if there's other specific concerns about a place like that, um, you can definitely reach out and um, and you know I can I can kind of address that more specifically if you have if you have a particular concern. Important question here from Megan uh, regarding rattlesnake bite. If you're bitten a distance from a trailhead, is it better to sit there and wait to be carried out, or which could take a long time, or to calmly and slowly walk out to the trailhead and get to care? Yeah, if, if you're by yourself, you, you need to walk out. Um, you and, and that is particularly if you don't have a cell phone signal, you need to get to a place where you have cell phone signal. And once you have cell phone signal and you're on the phone with an EMT, they're gonna talk you through what they want you to do. Um, and um, so you need to get to that cell phone area. Um, and so, you know, certainly when you get into, you know, more of the canyons and Boulder County, um, you know, rattlesnakes, they, they, they go up pretty high. Like, I mean, they'll get, you know, 9,000 feet or so. Um, it doesn't mean they're common. But but they are they they can be up there and so um, you know we we really want to be be careful with that. But if if you get nailed by a rattlesnake or you think you got hit by a rattlesnake, you need to kind of take your time. You don't need to run up a hill. You need to be mindful of your heart rate. But you just need to try to get to a place where you can get help. Um, and if you can send somebody ahead of you, like you pass somebody on the trail and you can send them back um, to the trailhead to call. That, that we really recommend that as well so that you can kind of start that process uh, much earlier on, especially if you can have somebody hike with you or something like that, um, if you need to hike out, it, it just may be necessary sometimes. If you're in a place where you're wide open, um, you have a cell signal, sit down and make the call, um, you know, if you feel safe in that area and just, you know, um, and then again, follow the advice of EMTs um, it's not necessary to, to really, you know, ask your body to do too much more than, than fight that bite. Great. All right. We have a couple more. Are you up for a couple more? I know we're running late. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I know folks have to leave and that's okay. Uh, we'll take these last couple that are in the, in the chat. And definitely send an email to me if you have specific, okay. I'll put the email on the screen. Um, I'm, I'm happy to answer those questions and I can, I can send something out to, um, to the whole group um, or send it to you, Sandy, and then we can, you can get it out to the whole group. We can kind of go from there. All right. Terrific. Scott Sievers has a question. Uh, are the state collection laws for captive herps sustainable in your opinion? And you might have to tell us what those are. Scott was explicitly told not to ask any tough questions, but um, <laughs> You know, no, it's a, uh, yeah, Scott, it's, it's a great question. Um, you know, the way the state looks at it is they look at it from um, the entire population of the state. They're not looking at it from necessarily a Boulder County um, or city of Longmont kind of, kind of view. And so um, certainly with the state's view of it, um, I think some of the laws could use some revisions, um, but um, in general, most of that stuff, you're going to see that, that the numbers for a lot of those species, 
they are probably sustainable considering that there's not a lot of there's not a, a significant amount of pursuit. The pursuit is 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 very limited. Now we do keep in mind of like particularly um, for any of you that do like Colorado birding trails out east and you're in box turtle country, we have a lot of box turtles. Um, but box turtles are being poached at phenomenal rates right now across the U.S. And so if you see a box a box turtle getting picked up, you should notify you know Operation Game Thief through CPW and, and ask a, a district wildlife manager to, to go out and investigate that. Um, because we don't wanna have, we, you know, huge box turtle poaching rings um, in Colorado. Um, so, so that's something that, that we definitely wanna watch. We know that milk snakes are hit pretty hard in Weld County um, in a couple spots, but we think milk snakes are pretty common throughout most of the rest of the state. Um, it, just, it just depends, but um, certainly, you know, Boulder County has seen declines in, in Western hognose snakes. Um, and some of that is, is impacted by pets, but some of that is just you're at the edge of their range. And so that species may no longer be a county species, you know, from, from any number of factors. It's hard to say that it's just pet trade. All right, uh, Margaret had a question, Margaret Wolf. Have you found any particularly successful strategies for getting diverse volunteers involved in this traditionally homogeneous field, homogeneous field? Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, certainly folks like, you know, Joy Kellner, Cole Wild, you know, people that cross over uh, pretty readily for, for all wildlife, they, they're super helpful because their excitement and enthusiasm you know, is, is very helpful with recruiting. At the same time, yeah, we, we want people that are interested, but we also don't want people that, you know, would necessarily, you know, go in after they know where all the spots are and clean out those sites. So we have to be very careful on how we sort of recruit volunteers. So um, it can be tricky, um, but generally when you are out there and you start putting names on, um, volunteer applications, not only with us, but with, with our agency partners, um, you know, you, you kind of, you know, people, you know, once they know that they're, that they're, you know, in the spotlight, like they, you know, that tend, that tends to weed out anybody that might be in question when we get the right people, um, right away. So, so, you know, you can get good volunteers, but you can also approach, Folks like Scott, you can approach folks with Boulder County and, and, and city and go through their volunteer programs more directly and, and you know, try to figure out ways to enhance those efforts within, within the city and build on the work that we've started. Um, but but you know, kind of say, hey, I want to do a little bit more with this and maybe find the right project that fits that, that energy level. So I would reach out to the agencies more directly rather than wait for us to necessarily get the next project. But that being said, you know, as we have projects, we certainly do look for folks that are interested in helping out. All right. We have one last one and we still have quite a few people here. So I'll go ahead and ask it and then we're gonna call it a night. Uh, thanks so much. Uh, the last one I'm gonna take is, are the, chytrid, are the pesticides or the chytrid fungus seeming to be the major cause of frog and herp declines? So that's settled. I know there's been discussion of that and the relative roles. Yeah. Of those um, yeah. So I mean, you know, the the chytrid fungus is is definitely significant, but it doesn't affect every amphibian the same way. Um, for for example, bullfrogs can be a carrier. They can move from pond to pond. Um, it's likely ends up on the legs of deer and blue herons and gets moved around. Chytrid fungus is it's it's a weird organism because you know it's it's also something that it's just because it's in a pond doesn't mean that it's always it's always going to affect something. Sometimes you have to wait for the right temperature and the right conditions for it to really grab hold of a host and 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 do its damage. Um, and so sometimes you know northern leopard frogs can you know can be in that pond and it can be okay, but other times they can be in there and it's it's not okay. Um, certainly looking at, at the situation with boreal toads in Colorado, um, it's, it's almost never okay um, for, for them. They just, they both collide at the wrong temperature and the wrong time, time of year. 
um, it's not that clear. And with pesticides, you know, you, there, there certainly is limited pesticide use in Boulder County, um, but you know, you wouldn't think that, you know, Boulder County is pretty on it as far as, as far as it's concerned. So yeah, there may be some effect, but there's a lot of really, really careful application of that. And, um, you know, I, I know that, that I know a, a lot of the folks who are charged with the spraying these habitats, they're, they're very careful with their measurements. They're very careful with what they're doing. They're very mindful of, of everything of, of what they're doing. So does it have an effect? Maybe. Is it, is it so significant? Um, uh, I, I don't think so, but I also will say we don't have enough information on that. And it's hard to do those studies sometimes for a variety of reasons. Um, but I would say the bigger issue is, um, you know, noxious weeds and um, habitat encroachment um, and just a lack of understanding. Um, you know, like people just need to be educated. Like by and large, there's probably more of these animals out there than what the dots on the map show. Um, and just simply recording these observations is gonna, is gonna better inform what's going on and answering some of these questions more directly. So, you know, just, you know, use iNaturalist or HeartMapper and, and put in those records and then folks like Scott and, 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 and other partners around the county and the state can, can really have a, have a better data set from which to work with. All right. Well, that was terrific. Thank you so much, Joe. I've learned a lot about um, our local reptiles and amphibians. Um, yeah, if, you have, if you have the uh, reactions button and want to send Joe a message, a <laughs> clap or unmute and say thanks, please do that, everybody. Um, and thanks for coming. Thanks for um, joining us. And uh, we'll see you next month. Yeah, thank you all. I really appreciate it.